we're going to talk a little bit about um, Internet of Things. Uh, we're going to talk about the future, the present, and the past. And I like it the other way around than normally. And I would like to have this one as interactive as possible. We're going to have the panelists presenting a couple of ideas about um, Internet of Things, but also after that, we're going to have some um, questions and answers. A brief introduction by myself. Uh, I work for ILS for the last uh, 15 years. Recently, in the last uh, four years, I was very active in um, the standards organization, especially for TIA. Uh, I hold um, um, the vice chair of the security ad hoc for the uh, TR50, and currently I'm the chair of the TR50, which is one of the engineering committee the, uh, for TIA. Um, if you need anything related to um, standards in terms of IoT and M2M, please do talk to me after that, the reception. Um, and also I participate from uh, TELET as uh, the representative for um, one M into the 1M2M, which is a much larger, larger organization um, related to um, creating a, a global and unique standard for um, Internet of Things. Um, that organization where TIA is part of it, it's a um, compass of uh, seven major SDOs and works are on their way. Uh, they had a lot of the, their first release on the beginning, at the beginning of February and um, it's an interesting development. So from the technology point of view, I think there are a lot of people working on that um, and there is a lot, of, a lot of support from companies to move things in the right direction. Um, my interest right now, when we're going to introduce the panelists, and also um, we want, I would like to present the Internet of Things and M2M in a such a way that it's a, a little bit of education also. Um, if terms are not understood, please interrupt us, interrupt me, interrupt the panelists, so that we can get a, an, uh, a better description of what we are trying to achieve today. So with that being said, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, we have uh, Stephen Meller, Chief Technology Officer at um, the Inter Industrial Internet Consortium. Uh, we have Liam Quinn, Fellow and Executive Director um, in the uh, Client Computing Group at Dell. And we have Todd Ritting, Chief Technology Officer at Panasonic uh, Corporation of North America. Uh, first of all, a little introduction about me. A little introduction about the IIC. Uh, my name is Stephen Meller. Um, I've been working in technology for a very long time now. Uh, my first real job was uh, at CERN, working on accelerators, and then at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, working on a variety of things, including the never-ending 30 years in the future, we'll have a Tokamak fusion reactor, uh, more accelerators, I like accelerators, uh, some work on radiation therapy, uh, Bay Area rapid transit, all involved in control systems that are quite local, right? They're not connected. You can't, from here, find out what time, directly, how late the train is at MacArthur Station in San Francisco area. You can't do that, right? They're not connected. Sure, they're highly connected within their own boundaries, but they're not connected to anything else. And then from that, uh, having learned how to work with a wide variety of real-time and embedded systems, I wrote some books with Paul Ward, Structured Development for Real-Time Systems, back in the day when structured was a good word, and then later Object-Oriented Analysis uh, with Sally Schleyer, when Object-Oriented was a good word. Uh, these days, everybody is keen on Agile. Yes, I'm responsible for some of that as well. I'm a signatory to the Agile Manifesto. Uh, <coughs> I think it's a pretty good bet uh, that IoT is the next big thing. But what I'd like to talk to you about here specifically is the industrial internet, which is a part of IoT. There's all sorts of different words. They overlap. People invent their own definitions. But the key here is industrial. And then talk a little bit about the consortium. So that gives you some idea about why this is important. There are some long words on this slide that as technologists you might not immediately recognize. Well, ubiquitous, that's just plain English, and so is connectivity. Uh, but what do those two words mean together? What they mean is, how is it that, for example, that drone is called? How is it that it knows where it is? How is it that each one of the different devices that you saw there is connected to others? 
And in my brief personal intro, I talked about control systems that were local, right? Clearly, that's connected. Has to be within that single factory, that chemical plant, that airplane, whatever it is, right? But when we say ubiquitous connectivity, we mean that all of these things are always connected, right? They are all connected. That means that if you so choose, and security and privacy is a huge issue here, but if you so choose, you can, in fact, have access to the Bay Area uh, Rapid Transit uh, control system. You can see where the trains are if you so choose, and they choose to let you. Right? You can compare the performance of this aircraft engine on this particular air aircraft with the data that you are reading. And by the way, terabytes of data come off an aircraft uh, every minute monitoring what the engines are doing, monitoring the avionics, monitoring this, that, and the other terabytes. But they're not connected, right? What happens, and I'm absolutely serious about this, is that those terabytes of data are downloaded by some person in a van, driving up to the airplane and plugging in a USB stick. Serious. Then they download it into a spreadsheet, and then if they remember, they send it to the aircraft manufacturer, who, if they remember, looks at it and says, hmm, that's interesting. It looks like this engine might fail in the not too distant future. And then they call the airline to say that, and the airline barks back, we know it broke down mid-flight and you fixed it in Anchorage. Now, imagine this instead. The airplane goes up to the gate. The data is transmitted wirelessly to the gate goes straight to the manufacturer, doesn't go to a person where it sits on a desk for a week, but instead goes to a program that looks at that data and compares it to past performance. And that's the second half of this sentence here, data analytics. Right, the idea that you can gather data from multiple, obviously related, it's no good capturing data about, for example, weather and boarding passes, though I'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, it's no good collecting those things and saying, well, how do they re relate over time? But there's a huge amount of value in looking at the degrading performance of an aircraft engine or a chip manufacturing plant or uh, <coughs> just exactly what's going on with the patient's heartbeat. Right? There's a huge amount that you can do if everything is connected and you can analyze all the data. And this is the reason for these big three cogs. The first one, of course, is the Industrial Revolution, where connectivity uh, allowed us to provide power remotely. Right? Initially, of course, it's all water mills and all that kind of thing, and that was good and right and proper. But once you had the electricity grid, you were off to the races. Right? The second revolution is the Internet Revolution, which again is all about connectivity, and you know all about that. I was at CERN uh, before Tim Berners-Lee. I was working actually on uh, writing uh, software uh, to allow multiple sh machines in an international organization where every country wanted to sell its own computers, meaning every country has different computers, uh, to connect all of these things together. And I was working there at, at, that, at that time b before he came along. But you just think how he could have imagined what we can do with the internet today. Right? No thought. I mean, his interest was in ensuring that you could uh, read an academic paper from another part of the lab. I mean, that's it, man. We're not talking about booking airplane tickets, et cetera, et cetera. The industrial internet is about, is about bringing these two things together. And there's one word hiding on this slide. It really should be quite large, but it's the very last one in red at the end. It's predictive. The idea that you can gather data, a lot of data, analyze it over time, and not just predict the behavior of a single aircraft engine or a single machine, but rather gather data over fleets and therefore predict their performance and therefore get really quite reasonable improvements in efficiency. Now, I didn't say huge improvements in efficiency. 1% in operational costs, just 1%, saves $30 billion in fuel cost in the aviation industry a year. 1% improvement. Now, there's lots of things that we can do that are not very complicated if we have the data. For example, 
not circling around airports over and over and over. I happen to live in the UK at the moment in the socialist paradise, and <coughs> I spend a lot of time going round and round and round over Heathrow Airport. The fuel cost is enormous. Imagine if the airplanes can talk to each other, schedule themselves. Think also of the regulatory and legal framework that's required to make all of this happen. And I can go on. There's a lot of numbers here. You can read them as easily as I can. But I just want to bring out uh, s another idea, which is not to do with money. And that's the notion of health care and how we can actually improve uh, health. Uh, consider, for example, uh, your small child in hospital, unfortunately, uh, with one of those O2 meters on his or her finger, which of course falls off because he's sick and he's writhing around and not happy. And also a respirometer, right, that measures the, uh, the respiration. Now what happens in a practical hospital is that nurses ignore alarms because they happen all the time. It goes beep, 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 the kid settles down again, the O2 meter works, everybody's happy, the alarm goes off, the nurse goes back to drinking tea. Well, well that's in the National Health Service, sorry. Uh, <coughs> you don't do that here. Um, <coughs> and they're not connected in any way. Now imagine instead that the respirometer and the O2 meter could talk to each other and they would only make an alarm if they were both off or one was off for a long time, meaning you have to go and turn up and make sure that you put the thing back on again. Right? That's a, like a saving of a life. Right? We're not just talking dollars here. Right? But the key thing that you need to get from this is that a very small improvement in efficiency caused by gathering data and being able to predict saves huge sums of money and it saves lives. Now, this is a wonderful vision, I think, uh, but there are some roadblocks to growth. The problem is that people speak different languages, <coughs> right? Government talks one language, I know. Uh, people in academia talk another language, completely different. How do you get them to cooperate and work together with, for example, the transportation industry? <laughs> Uh, or the energy industry, which has very long life cycles, or, or, or. The size of the opportunity is around $32 trillion. Right, that's about the amount that's affected globally uh, by being able to connect these machines in some way. But unless you can connect them, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. Right, so what we need is to do something about that. Uh, clearly, what needs to be done is to remove that roadblock by finding a way in which people can communicate with each other. That means standards, right? Now, the trouble with standards is that everybody can have one, and there are so many to choose from, right? So how are you going to know that one particular standard works together with another standard, that these things fit together to make a coherent whole? The answer is it's rather difficult. <laughs> what you need to be able to do is to work through a whole stack of stuff from uh, big data at the top, the cloud, and all that stuff that you hear about, down through uh, operational issues like how you control machines across fleets, down through connectivity, which of course is the main interest of TIA, down to the chip and the security on the chip. Right? That's a very, very big task because it goes from the top of the stack down to the bottom. And the industrial space is quite large. I'm not going to define it exactly, but I am going to say that it includes things like manufacturing, healthcare, connected cars, that kind of stuff. Uh, the drone, I would include pretty much everything else. I don't care about the Fitbit, and I don't care about the, the, um, uh, the cycling machine, as you can probably tell. Uh, but <coughs> we're interested in industry. And estimates say it's about a 3% saving is what you can get. Now, five large industrial global companies, they happen to be based in the US, but these five global companies, uh, GE, AT&T, Intel, Cisco, and IBM. I made it. I always forget one, but this time I didn't. Those five uh, companies together realized that they were solving similar problems over and over again. And what they did was to attempt, thank you, to avoid this uh, roadblock by forming the Industrial Internet Consortium. Now, like most things of this nature, including actually an internet and laundry on the ground floor of the building where I live, uh, has a lengthy mission statement, which doesn't mean a whole lot, but there are three key words here. 
Now those three key words are at the bottom. Transformational business outcomes. You want to change the economy. Right? We're talking 3% a year till around 2030. That's a huge sum of money, $32 <coughs> trillion. Dollars. Right, so that's the goal of the consortium. And the way in which the consortium works is by making it so that we don't have to have the same bilateral agreements over and over and over again. And that includes both technical stuff and business stuff. Right? You don't want to have to draw up a legal agreement about how we're going to protect our data over and over and over again, although there will be problems. And this, again, is very important to you because policies about data here and policies about data in Europe are radically different. Right? So our goal, then, is to ensure that these things interoperate. We are not a standards organization. It's not our goal to create standards. We wish to rely on the good offices of TIA and similar organizations, lots of them, I'm afraid, as I say, many to choose from, uh, to ensure that these bits fit together. <coughs> so we have a large number of uh, members, the five initially. We uh, were officially announced in, let me see, it will be something on the order of 18 hours. It'll be a, in 18 hours, it'll be a year. And then we had five members. Uh, we, at the beginning of the week, had 150. Monday it was 151. Today it's 153. And these are the three main areas in which we work. And this is my last slide. I'm sure you'll be grateful. Uh, the first thing is in constructing an ecosystem. Uh, I was in a meeting this morning uh, focused on standards harmonization at the IIC. We have a quarterly meeting. It happens to be in Washington this quarter. Um, and we had uh, 200 people. Uh, our first meeting uh, a year ago, uh, we all could sit around a table. Now we have a massive room with 200 people in it. Uh, but in that standards harmonization meeting, there were three people who were invited, who were invited simply because the convener of that meeting was chatting with them the day before and said, you know, you ought to come and join us and let's see if we can sort this out. So ecosystem is huge trying to make sure that we have people talking to each other so that we can uh, harmonize these various elements. Second main area is technology and security. Uh, I won't go into much detail, as I understand that you're uh, not, not specifically technical. But what we're after here is the key word is interoperability. And you also need, and this is extremely important and a gain of interest to legal minds, uh, data, security, and privacy absolutely critical. Earlier, I mentioned something about looking at weather patterns and uh, um, boarding passes and how they're unconnected. Actually, you can, if you look at vast amounts of data, discover that, well, these things are totally uncorrelated. And then, if you discover that there is a correlation, it could actually be a security risk. Yeah? That's important. Right? So there's data, there's security, there's privacy, interoperability, those are the big things. All of this is just a bunch of paper. I've got lots of it in my bag over there. I have PowerPoint slides. Clearly, the problem is solved. <laughs> what we need to do is to ensure that it works. And that's why we have test beds. And we fund these uh, as the companies themselves fund them, and also <laughs> in public-private partnerships to ensure that these work. And then all of this information feeds back and forth, hence these uh, arrows. But it all leads to innovative new products. As I said, Werner's Lee never had any idea at all about the kind of products that you see today. So that's uh, the big story about the Industrial Internet Consortium. Thank you. Thank Liam. You Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Liam Quinn. I'm at uh, Dell, uh, which is um, one of the biggest uh, startup companies in the world, now that we're private. Uh, and I actually lead the Internet of uh, Things strategy at Dell. And um, this is a presentation we gave at Dell World, and it shows a taxonomy of how we view the uh, IoT and how we talk to our customers. It all starts about acquiring the data, and that's data that's actually acquired or generated by sensors, smart sensors, smart nodes, and so forth. And they can be placed on a lot of physical objects or objects that are not connected to the Internet. Uh, once you acquire the data, then you've got to move it somewhere. Okay? And there's lots of ways to move it. You can either move it over a standards-based network, it could be wired or wireless, or it could be proprietary, because 
in reality, there's a lot of proprietary networks out there given different vertical market segments. So not all protocols are open. And I think it's going to be a lot of challenges and opportunities for companies to integrate legacy systems into uh, new IoT-based solutions. After you acquire the data, then you've got to actually store it somewhere because there's different protocols, different feeds coming in from thousands and thousands of sensors, and you've got to store it somewhere. So that when you think of storage, you think of um, uh, memory, you think of uh, disks, you think of uh, hard drives, you think of other storage mechanisms. And again, a lot of the, uh, all the data does not have to move from the point of origin to the point of, of the cloud. Some data may be stored locally or may be analyzed locally because uh, if you're in a hospital, for example, you don't want your, um, your blood work having to go all the way to the cloud and back to, in order to make some changes to your insulin or to your medication. So th this concept of tiered storage. So some storage may be local, and even the analytics may be tiered as well and may be local. After you store the data, then as Steve said, you've got to analyze the data because data without uh, do nothing with is really not uh, productive. So analyzing the data and, tell you and understanding what the data means. And then <coughs> the next one then is the, the acting on the data. What's the, what are you going to do about the data? Are you going to leave it sitting on somebody's desk? Are you going to send it to the manufacturer? Or are you going to actually connect the dots and analyze and do something about it? So you think about screens, you think about dashboards, you think about remediation of what you're doing with the data. The center for us from our perspective is that the core tenets for us is all about the security of the data, the privacy of the data, and the governance. And while people talk about the Internet of Things, we talk about the intranet of things versus the Internet of Things. And we don't believe that the Internet of Things is going to be realistic for multiple years to come because of a lot of the issues around governance and around privacy of data. So a lot of our partners, a lot of our customers are looking for solutions based on their needs, based on their uh, particular business. So we tend to talk about intranets of things versus the Internet of Things. So when you look at this, um, you'd say, what's Dell's play in this? Because a lot of people think of Dell as a PC company, right? Dude, you're getting a Dell. You know that ad, remember, years ago? Well, actually, Dell is broken down into four divisions. We've got the client group, which is all about the, the desktops, notebooks, workstations, uh, tablets, and, and mobile pro uh, products. We've got networking. We've got storage. We've got data centers. And we've got services, which is the Ross Perot system. Our partners are looking for solutions that can actually scale. So it's not about, we're not a sensor company, we're not a PC company, we're an IT company. And we can provide the end-to-end -end solutions for customers that are looking for that because it really is an end-to-end -end approach to IoT. It's not a particular point product. Um, I think uh, the challenges, as Steve said earlier, there's going to be a lot of challenges around uh, standards, interoperability, um, I was at the IIC yesterday and I actually um, uh, had a question to the steering committee around interoperability. And when you look at Bluetooth today, you know the Bluetooth logo, you know that the Bluetooth headset will work with your car because both have got Bluetooth and you know that it's that good sense of interoperability. When you look at Wi-Fi, if there's Wi-Fi in your hotel room, in your home, in the airport, and you've got Wi-Fi on your phone or Wi-Fi on your platform, you know it works. The industry needs around IoT to have that seal of approval of interoperability. It doesn't exist today. I think there's vertical, vertical segments out there, but I think there's a need for that interoperability and to accelerate that. So, the you know our feedback to standards bodies is standards are good, industry moves, and the industry is not going to wait for standards to evolve because they can take multiple years. So, I think you're going to see some. Um, some real need for interoperability and certification around IoT sooner than later. So from a Dell point of view, uh, we are actually um, going to be uh, key participants in the IoT space. We have got key uh, vertical markets that we're working with and customers and, and segments. Uh, we're going to be very deliberate in working with those customers, understanding their needs, designing systems with them. Uh, delivering systems, partnering with third parties, like uh, one of our key partners is Intel, a very strong partner. Um, and we're actually going to work very closely with our customers in order to deliver solutions and not uh, point products. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, the next gentleman here. Thank you.
I'm very grateful to be here. My name is Todd Ridding. I'm CTO of Panasonic North America. And uh, many of you might be saying, why is Panasonic here? And what on earth do they do with IoT? Uh, most of people think of Panasonic as TVs, cameras, maybe the occasional microwave. Our message is that uh, Panasonic is broader than that. Uh, here in North America, about 85% of our revenue comes from business to business sales. And uh, they cover a broad spectrum. And so when, when we talk about IoT and people ask, Does, is Panasonic doing anything in IoT? Our answer, number one, is yes. Number two is we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, we've been a couple of decades. Uh, the, the Wiser Lock demonstration was a part of an acquisition. In 1997, we were connecting things to the internet and taking advantage of the value. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the Netscape logo. Uh, for any of you geeks who remember Netscape, that's a long time ago. Uh, we were doing energy management systems with cloud connectivity in the year 2002. And so that starts to make people ask questions. Well, if you were doing it you know, 15 years ago, why isn't, aren't things farther along? And there are good reasons for that that I think we'll be talking about as part of the panel. One of them is there has to be value. There has to be a reason why people want these things connected. At uh, Panasonic, we do things, we IoT things from small to big. In the middle section, you'll see some home security products and then some of the things Panasonic is known for in the business industry, toughen laptops and uh, tablets and point of sale terminals and things like that. These are all connected to the internet and they're used as part of solutions. So if you look at the definition of IoT, all these things that we've been selling for years are part of that. In the far right hand corner, we have some bigger things. To Panasonic, a 747 is a thing in the Internet of Things because we're the world's number one supplier of in-flight entertainment. So the, the little TV screen you watch when you're on a long flight is probably one of ours, if it worked. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the point is that not only is that screen uh, part of Internet of Things, but we provide all the connectivity from the screen through all the cables or wireless systems in the plane. We make the antenna that goes on the top of the plane. We manage the communications from the plane to the satellite to the ground back to a control station in California where we monitor real time every plane in the air throughout the world that has our equipment on it. And that's probably three to 4,000 planes at, at a time. And so uh, 747 is a thing. Uh, the, the next picture down is automotive. We're one of the leading providers of multimedia systems in automotives and cars are connected more and more today. So a car can be a thing. Uh, the, the next picture down is of the, the large outdoor LED displays in the Philadelphia Eagles Stadium. We just completed a retrofit uh, last, uh, a few months ago. And uh, big, huge displays that are 10, 20,000 square feet are things in the Internet of Things all the way to solar panels. We uh, manage and monitor uh, several hundred solar panel, commercial solar panel installations in the United States. So those are all things to Panasonic, and that's why we're here. Um, part of our strategy of IoT, one of the things I should mention is that IoT, as has been alluded to, is, is a new label on an activity that's been going on for a long time. Um, IoT is just the latest label on connecting and, and uh, acquiring information. We made an announcement uh, last Monday that we are taking some of our technology that we've been working on for a couple of decades and making it open. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because we believe, as several other people have mentioned, that being open and participating in a community is a better way to ensure security and robustness of solutions than just going on our own. And so uh, you'll see us being more involved in the external industry and in open source consortia because of this kind of one step in our Internet of Things plan. Um, let's see, it was Liam who mentioned that uh, acquire, transport, aggregate, analyze, and act. And then um, I believe Stephen talked about that the connectivity analytics and that, that cycle of taking advantage of the connectivity. I drew it a diff little bit different uh, way, but the, the interesting thing is that we're all saying similar things. 
uh, you hear a lot about connectivity when you're thinking about Internet of Things. But the message is, it's not just connecting. You have to connect, you have to get the information to another place, usually the cloud or some place where it can be useful. You have to understand the information. You have to process it, analyze it, combine it with other sources of information so that you can present it to the consumer or the customer so it has value. So as a consumer, you can visualize that on a plane, I want to see the movie that I select. But as a, as a customer or a B2B connection, it might be a database or it might be a, a factory or it might be a control system that needs the information. But unless you're doing those, last, th those two last things and not just connecting, but understanding and, and producing value, then it's really a wasted exercise. It's really just a, a science experiment or a toy. And so that's in our, in our perspective where we really need to invest and innovate is how you take the information and use it for value. One of the questions we get asked as part of this kind of a discussion is, well, what can government and the, the regulatory industries do to help us? Well, that's a balancing act. We don't want too much control, so it stifles, but we do need some uh, help in certain areas. And so what we'd like to suggest is the government address legitimate consumer protection issues and uh, do things like security and privacy are two active areas that we appreciate. And on the other side, where you have uh, industry, it's our job to develop consensus and standards and keep abreast of technology because it moves so fast. And then in that balancing act, try to figure out how to work together so that we're, it's more of a, a partnership rather than anything adversarial. So, our challenge to us as an industry, and here at TIA we are an industry, is to assume for a moment that you know how to connect. There's many different ways, there's many different solutions for communicating information, and TIA companies, are member companies are taking care of that. Uh, cloud, data, wireless, all those kinds of things. But the challenge is over on the right. Assume you have all the information you wanted associated with your products or systems. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to take that information and process it so it creates value? That's the real challenge. And that involves things like protecting it, uh, analyzing it, combining it with other third-party sources of information, and then presenting it to the user of the information, being it a human or a machine, in a way that creates value. And so that's what Panasonic's perspective on IoT is. So I'm Fred Jens. Thank you uh, for coming today. Thanks for letting us uh, spend some time with you and, and letting Mihai moderate. This is certainly an exciting time for everybody. Um, if you haven't heard of the, of the Internet of Things, you're hiding under a big rock somewhere, and I don't even know where that rock would be today. Um, so the real question is, where isn't the Internet of Things? Uh, there's a lot of technologies. There's a lot of pieces and parts. There's chips and sensors and transportation protocols, and there's there's clouds and data centers that make this all happen. And there's standards in the, in the, in the place of, of where this takes place as well. So it's, it's certainly a relevant and fun place to be. So Tellit, just to give you a couple, uh, what I'll call Tellit by the numbers. So Tellit's uh, almost 800 people. We've been around for about 15 years. Uh, we speak 47 languages in our company. We're exceptionally global. We're, it's the smallest, largest global company I've ever worked for. You know, about 5,000 customers worldwide and growing. And when I say 5,000 customers, these are people that make things. So we're not a brand you'd see. We're kind of the, you know, the, I don't want to say it, but you know, kind of the, the intel inside of a lot of things, right? So people think of it that way. So when you have a connection, you got to have technology to connect it. We're kind of an embedded enablement company to make the IoT world uh, a reality. Um, we're certified and, and operate over 31 operators worldwide and have a, a, a great, great footprint. Our whole game is to try to make IoT easy. And while there's a lot of pieces and parts, uh, I like to talk about, you know, kind of M to M IoT 1.0 is you hire a bookkeeper, the guy shows up his first day work and you say, hey, go spend 18 months, go write a spreadsheet program, and then we'll work on a balance sheet. Right? That's not the way you should do it. You should start with better tools and better standards to put things together. So what we do is we start way at the edge, enabling things with technologies, whether those technologies are cellular radios, any version, positioning technologies, et cetera. 
and that we move through basically the ability to transport that information through both resale, bundling, and wholesale relationships with operators as well as OEMing our technologies to operators. And then we provide a mechanism to take all this cool information that's come from all these newly connected things and make it business relevant. Because a connection without application is called cost, and those things don't last very long. So, and we like to call this, you saw it at the tail end of that video, one stop, one shop. So the idea is keep it simple, keep it easy, allow technology to be implemented quickly to create value. And as I said, whether it's short range, unlicensed spectrum, whether it's cellular from 2G to LTE and beyond, see where that goes, to you know, airtime, cloud services, et cetera, that's what ILS is all about. And I'm very happy that, that uh, Mihai is so very active in the, uh, the standards community and leading in, in the ways that he does because without standards, without organizations like TIA contributing to the ecosystem, uh, I think a lot of things you saw in the video would not really become a reality. So I'll turn it back to everybody else and thank you for letting us have the opportunity to sponsor this event. I'm gonna ask the panelists a question because I think I wanna stimulate a little bit of a discussion. Um, there, is, there is an aspect of the Internet of Things that some of the folks out there are kind of uh, looking around. And um, since I've been working with Internet of Things and M2M for uh, the last three, four years, I want to ask each of you, um, what do you think is the difference in the terminology between Internet of Things and M2M? So I want to get an opinion for, from the experts. I want to put an opinion out there. Do we have to say one, the other? The machine-to-machine -machine idea is focused around machines talking to each other. So there's connectivity and a certain degree of interoperability. But the Internet of Things has the idea of taking that data and analyzing it and doing something with it. Yeah. So instead of doing this, we're doing that. And that makes a big difference. When I think of the Internet of Things, I think of the physical world is now connected today, getting on the internet, um, which will include machines. And ultimately, those machines will and, and can and will have the capability to communicate with each other. So whether you talk th about that as the Internet of Things, th I'm fine with that. But, um, so I think it's just the, the physical world getting connected to the Internet where it doesn't exist today. And the more intelligence that's out there in those physical devices and those physical entities, then they will take on the capability to communicate without human intervention back and forth to each other. And of course, there's lots of little data generated by sensors and machines, which ultimately lead to big data over time. So uh, whether they talk to each other, they're still generating data that needs to be analyzed. The machines may have the analytics to analyze another machine's data stream, and it may have the intelligence then to maybe move that data or that's the analysis of the data to a, a different level uh, for some remediation or some action. So. I think it's, uh, it's all sort of circular. Uh, if we remove the label IoT or M to M, the internet is basically a bunch of computers talking to each other, right? That's, that's all it is. And as we progress through history, you know, we were talking to computers 30 years ago. And uh, as we add more and more things we connect to, whether it's a machine or a sensor or a person or something you use every day, uh, what we're seeing is just more and more things that we're familiar with being connected and having access to that information. I absolutely agree that analysis is very important because if you can't use the information, then why collect it? And so that's where we get into the, you know, making sure that we are understanding and creating value from this whole topic of discussion, whether it's M to M, Internet of Things, or whatever. It's still just a continuation of an ev evolution of technology that's been going on for decades. The Pentagon some time ago uh, tried to move up all of the information so that they could understand where things were going. And they ended up centralizing a lot of the control in the Pentagon and not having a great deal of autonomy down at the, uh, down at the platoons, battalions, and so on and so forth in the field. Now that sounds great because then you have total control over everything. The trouble is that if you lose network connectivity or something goes wrong or you have data that cannot be analyzed in time, then you get into real trouble. So you have to have the ability to pass the plans down 
to the local devices as well. So they can operate autonomously, which is the word that Liam used, and communicate with each other. Right now we're getting to a whole different level. I'll, I'll stop there because it gets technical. But you understand the, you know, the, the, the fundamental issue of where the control lies. And just connecting things, that's just, yeah, who cares? Any folk can do that. So there is no notion of IoT on M2M. Why those words are coming up right now when the word automation has been since 70 years ago, 75 years ago? What made it different that those two acronyms are coming up, or one acronym? Pick one of them. It doesn't Marketing. Marketing. Yeah, it's marketing. It's all it is. It's like, it's like the term cloud, you know. Yeah, everything is I mean, cloudy. It used to be digital service. and IBM was doing cloud computing back in the 50s and 60s, and then cloud became the du jour word in the last five, ten years. IoT has been around for the last 30, 40 years. OnStar has been around since the 80s. That was a form of IoT. Um, uh, so. IoT right now is it's the buzzword, so it's a good marketing term. But uh, I, think, I think the genesis that is happening right now is because of integration of technology, lower cost points of the technology, uh, die size shrinks, Moore's Law, things are so small and sw so integrated they can be put into lots and lots of things that couldn't, weren't uh, doable five, ten years ago, simply because of the size of silicon, the cost, and the power draw. And I think that's, uh, that's the catalyst that's actually driving the opportunity right now around IoT. But the term IoT is a good marketing term. And I, I, think, I think we would all agree that saying it's a marketing term, I didn't mean to say that derogatory or anything like that. I welcome it because it's, it, it it's apparently is a good term to capture people's imagination and to get a discussion going on what's happening. And if that's what it does, then that's great. I, we welcome it. And, and so we proudly talk about our IoT strategy, knowing that we've been working on this for a long time. But uh, if, if that's what we can use to capture people's attention and get them engaged in what's happening, then that's, one, that's great. Hey, is this working? OK. Um, I'm Josh New from the Center for Data Innovation. And I think the, the definition of the Internet of Things is an important, it touches on an important subject. Um, we, you know, us in the know, we know what it is. We can argue about the specifics of whether or not it's same time, whether or not it's other things. But 10 years from now, this, it's going to be a dated term. Everything will be the Internet of Things. It'll sound as dated as the information superhighway. It just doesn't even make sense to say anymore. Um, and I think this lack of education on the issue currently is, is a really pressing issue, particularly uh, regarding privacy and security. Um, I was here actually this morning. Microsoft did an event on... Uh, privacy and innovation in the age of the Internet of Things, and one of the issues was addressed, is that all the all the legal standards, all the the policy approaches you can have towards better policy, better security, or better privacy, better security in the Internet of Things, just as importantly, and I think it gets out of, left out of the discussion a lot, is consumer education. And so, I guess my question to you would be, what, how do you see the responsibility of that, um, educating your your customers, your business partners, your your clients? Um, do you see that as your role? Do you see that as something Congress needs to take on to educate them in some other capacity? How are you planning on approaching that? I see that as our role, <laughs> meaning everybody in this room. Uh, it's, it's a collaborative thing. We do, as Panasonic, we of course need to do that. One of the things we need to take the responsibility for, representing the, you know, part of our business is the consumer electronics uh, uh, business. And we are totally capable of building products that are far beyond people's ability to use. I mean, I have a, a Panasonic camera, and I have to work to exercise all the functionality in that thing. It's, it's a very complex piece of equipment. And so as, as we move into the future, I'm hoping that we as an industry can uh, concentrate on providing the functionality that people can actually, I'm sorry for broken recording this, but. Uh, make a difference in people's lives. And so we have a responsibility as the provider of some of the products that people uh, use, but you know, the government and the rest of the industry and our trade associations all have a responsibility to help educate everybody. I mean, that's, that's a big challenge, but uh, I think that if we get enough conversations and enough messages going the right way, that uh, it'll, it'll be a positive difference. So um, based on our model, which is a direct model, so we talk to millions and millions of customers every year, 
so we have a direct relationship. We don't go through a channel for, for any of our uh, product distribution or sales. So we're constantly talking to customers and getting feedback from customers. Um, and it really, it really is understanding what customers want and, and solving issues and, and s problems that customers have, particularly in, the, in some of the major segments. Um, so it really, uh, we're, we're actually going to take that responsibility. We take that responsibility of educating our customers on our products, our solutions, our approach to delivering solutions. And it's a direct model. Um, it, um, so I don't think it's like you've got to wait around for the government to do it. It's, it's really, I think it's incumbent upon companies to have that direct relationship and education and discussion with their customers. You know, in the presentation that all three of you gave, you talked of value for the customer. Could you address what do you think is ready to deliver value, what's not, and what are the thresholds that we have to go through so those things that we're dreaming about actually become possible? So for, for us, it's, um, it really is, is working with some very direct customers on IoT where they want an end-to-end -end solution. They want us to deliver gateways. They want us to deliver other client devices that may help in their, in their configuration. They want us to be able to analyze the data, which we have, uh, you know, Dell has acquired like 30 companies over the last six years, like $20 billion in acquisitions. So we've got analytics, uh, number of companies, software capabilities. We have the most secure uh, client devices out there, and we're going to bring that security architecture and strategy into our IoT components of a solution. So we don't see it as like, here's the IoT solution and here is the IT solution. It's an IT solution that includes IoT elements in there for the needs of a customer. And every customer is different and they're very diverse. Um, and then we've got the capability to analyze the data as well as stores, uh, do the number crunching, do the servers, the back end, uh, and also the, the consulting and services that go along with that. So our value proposition is really that end-to-end -end approach to the customers. We talk a lot about intranets of things for that particular segment, whether it's a smart building, it's a retail, it's an embedded process, oil and gas. I think uh, your second part of the question is the challenges, I think, is the interoperability where you could have that logo of saying this is what, um, IoT certified. And I think that's something we've got to work through as a company. That's something we have to work through as an industry as well in order to get that true interoperability where people know that they could buy a device from Dell, they could buy a device from another PC OEM, and know that it works from in an IoT configuration. The industry is not there today, and it's going to be a while to get there. Now, I think there's a third part of your question. Um, you know, the beauty of something like the internet is it works anywhere in the world, it's the same protocol, and people who manufacture devices are able to use it as the intermediator to communicate between things. You now introduce storage, you have data running around, you have sensors, you have actuators, you have interfaces. Okay. Are we in some sense looking for what are simple protocols that can give us that kind of universality in some of those other areas? I don't think that there's a number, IP is really the universal protocol out there. When you look at a lot of uh, uh, market segments, there are protocols that are very proprietary for that particular segment. And there's some protocols that we, have, we thought were gone, like or it's 232 or I2C or serial bus or parallel bus. But believe me, th those are used today in a tremendous amount of the industries out there. And they want to integrate those legacy environments into the new modern world of IoT. And companies will have to support those. And solutions will have to get either get developed or evolve in order to bring those legacy environments into an IP-based environment. And I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of either standards-based protocols that we all thought were gone, and there's lots and lots and lots of proprietary protocols that nobody's ever heard about that need to be as part of an IoT solution. 
uh, Shade Oshinubi, PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. So you all were talking about legal and policy uh, considerations, specifically privacy and security. Uh, I think Liam touched on um, a part of my question, talking about transport. Uh, you mentioned Wi-Fi, Ethernet, network bandwidth. I'm curious to know what the panelists think we need as far as wireless infrastructure and spectrum use to support this future of uh, Internet of Things. Wi-Fi is well understood today. Uh, the IEEE is working on a number of new standards like 802.11ah in the 900 megahertz band, 802.11af in the white space, TV white space spectrum band. Um, it's the unlicensed band, so in reality, incumbents can, or other companies can come in there, or other segments of the industry can come in there. A spectrum is like land, there's only so much. Um, it would be nice if the government and the FCC release more spectrum, because more spectrum means you can have more devices in there. There are clever ways to use spectrum and reuse spectrum. So, for example, in the TV white spaces, if somebody's not using spectrum in a particular city or municipality, you can actually have unlicensed devices use that spectrum and then maybe hop off those channels if the TV channel happens to get turned on. Um, so more spectrum is good and I think if there was a policy or a legislation that could be done by the industry is to encourage the FCC in the US and in other parts of the world to release more spectrum because then you can have more devices in there. I think the the concept of mesh networking and agile networking is going to come in very much in IoT where you can actually hop or use and reuse spectrum either in the licensed spectrum or unlicensed spectrum or other segments um, uh, where appropriate. But I think that's where I, I talked earlier about this tiered networking or tiered architecture because not everything has got to move to the, to the cloud. When you think of the billions of devices that are projected to be connected to the internet, if they were all to try and connect to the internet today to bring the network down. So this concept of machine to machine where you can actually have direct, it's called Wi-Fi direct or, or direct connectivity so you're not going through an access point or a tower. You know, things like that are going to be smart ways around connections. And computation in the, at the edge. Yes. Just really quickly, if you look at the white paper, uh, page six, uh, the recommendation utilizes spectrum policy that maximizes the continuity of connectivity. If you look at the second paragraph and beyond, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of new technologies that are being proposed that we would recommend that the uh, policymakers look at to help us. Specifically, they point out predictability, flexibility, efficiency, and priority. And without taking your time, read the section. That's a really good answer to it, I think. Lamore Schaffman, RCR Wireless. I'd like to hear one point from each of you of what is the major block to what we see here as IoT, IOE, whatever you want to call it. Uh, just each one of you from your particular perspective, skip the FCC in that since we just heard about that. Data. Data ownership, how, how, you, how you treat data. Ownership, privacy, uh, what happens when it crosses a geographical boundary, who has access to it, who owns it. I mean, just think about who owns a piece of data. Though, I mean, this is a TIA, right? It's all about telecommunications, but the data is the thing that we're moving, and that's what counts, and we're not putting anything like enough attention on that. Um, from my perspective, it's security, because all of these billions of devices are potential attack surfaces, and security is the most paramount because it just is a whole rich environment for people to go try and hack. And I agree with those two answers. So another key part, not more important or less important, is uh, I'm going to be a broken record, is the value. We're, we're th this whole technology industry uh, sometimes builds things because we can, not because we should. And as soon as we demonstrate value that people can use or save money by shaving 1% off, uh, you'll see success. And we already have examples of success today. So it's is taking that information and turning it into value. That's, that's the business case. Uh, that's hard for an engineer to say, but that's actually uh, a hurdle. I, I was just going to add that it's not a, a one-way value proposition here. Um, for example, in Iceland, 
uh, there's a huge amount of uh, genetic information about the population. And because it's a relatively isolated population, you can learn a huge amount from that. And the question is, who owns that data? Well, is it the one person who had a terrible disease, or is it the whole population? How do we, we need models for how we think about that kind of information, right? When I'm driving along, and I see that on my GPS, a little red zone, why is that? It's because the cell towers are gathering the data and saying, these phones aren't moving, there's a problem. So we need models to think about that, I think. So it's, it's, it's not just value, it's stepping into other models too. I would like to thank uh, the panelists, Todd, Liam, and Stefan. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. Thank you very much for everything.